The new Legion of Superheroes number one. We've switched into kind of a, a sepia tone color, which I, I think indicates flashback in this case. And and I they kind of do that in film sometimes too, right? Yeah. Um, you see, we've got uh, two soldiers here. Um, they eventually name one another, and we realize one of them is Rock, Rock Quinn. Rock Crin. <laughs> former uh, cosmic boy and uh, it ends horrifically with an explosion and, and somebody has been hurt, possibly dismembered here. We flip the page. We see that it was a dream, a dream rock. Crin has had a, a, a post-traumatic stress type of dream, which he's very nonchalant about in, in a kind of funny way. Like, he mentions, well, at least I didn't wake up screaming this time. And like, I hope I didn't bother my wife with all my screaming, <laughs> my morning screaming. It's just like a daily part of his life. <laughs> his wife turns out um, to be Lydia, um, former, uh, former night girl, former sub night girl. They finally got married and... Uh, Moved into the the shambles of their dreams. Everything's very dilapidated. It seems though Giffen kind of draws everything dilapidated. I assume that just everything in the future is torn up and covered in stains. Yeah, and uh, Lydia is very clearly pregnant here. Yeah, like it's like he has this dream all the time. Right. Yeah. PTSD. Right. It's not even like a big deal. It's just like <laughs> I don't know how much they were talking about PTSD back then. Were they even calling it PTSD? Maybe it was still like shell shock or... Oh, probably, yeah. Probably shell shock or battle battle fatigue. Battle fatigue. I think there's a whole George Carlin sketch about that. But yeah, they they start doing names. this this kind of effect where it's only word balloons that kind of overlap each other. Mm -hmm. And you can't tell who's saying what just as a way to emphasize kind of uh, chaos happening. Right, right. And I think actually in, in later issues when they do stuff like this, they um, they have Tom McGraw kind of color the whole instead of the white, it's kind of a um, kind of a dirty magenta color kind of. Mm -hmm. they, if they had thought of it, they would have done it here. They do it in, the, in right. subsequent issues. I think it works good the way it is, though. Yeah. And the way the dream sort of falls apart towards the end is much like real dreams mm. and it also gives it kind of a scary twilight zone feel like this isn't how it happened. Right. Right. Yeah. I think, uh, rock, he's still looking pretty good in his right. undies here. Yeah. Still staying fit. Um, even though he is, age. he's, uh, you know, how old do you say he was like, he's 38 now. I think that's right. I, I wish I looked that good when I was 38. <laughs> um, and yeah, she is very pregnant. Does he ever have his child in this series? I yeah. mean, he has to, but I don't remember what. Like by issue nine, does uh, he have a kid? I've forgotten. For some reason, I thought it was in the by the Inman days, but maybe it was before. Yeah, it seems like it would have to be somewhat prior to that because Inman didn't come on until 38 or 39 or something. Well, I mean, we got through uh, Levitz's whole run happened in like five or six years. I yeah. mean, I guess they kind of they knows? kind of write out um, Lida, and she doesn't get used too often. So I bet they probably would cut to her in the annuals or something, and and show where she's at in her pregnancy that's been going on for two right. years. Right, and that's the other thing we we don't know how long they carry. Yeah, she's not human, huh? She's Cassoonian. Mm -hmm. Neither of them are human. Her baby may only uh, grow in darkness or when the sun is down or something like that. Oh, yeah. Crazy. Maybe spoons and forks like get stuck to her stomach because of rocks. Oh, lineage. yeah, weird. <laughs> Or maybe his magnetic powers only work in the dark. It's weird when these, <laughs> I, I don't know how they, like these these different, they're humanoid, right? They're not the same humans that we have here on planet Earth, but they look like humans. 
and they're white people from other planets. And right. They, I think invasion goes a long way to kind of smooth all that out because aren't they all like Earth people who are experimented on? Yeah, I guess so. But not, getting the powers and I'm just thinking and, like, what is it? What? How do they have kids together? They're only like a thousand years removed from one another, though. I mean, yeah. they haven't like evolved into different uh, like species. Yeah, but they have drastically different super abilities, which is kind of like a, what a different species would have. That's true, but I, I don't think it would be any weirder than Mr. Fantastic and Invisible Woman having a kid, which is weird. But mm-hmm. And actually, um, Night Girl... She didn't have any inherent powers, right? Her father used her as a guinea pig and gave her the powers. Oh, that does complicate things, maybe. I would think that would probably about that. possibly make her unable to have children. Maybe. And maybe whatever made uh, Cosmic Boy l- lose his powers. What a strange power to give your daughter if you're trying to get her into, like, the Legion. Yeah, totally. Like... Well, I don't think he was like trying that, to get her into the Legion. He was trying to give her superpowers because he wished, wished right. that she was a boy. Man, right. poor old night girl. See, that power in particular seems like a shame to have wasted that origin on because it does seem to lend itself to a possible strange evolutionary, like maybe the super predators, come, not the super that kind of super predator, like big monsters <laughs> come out late at night. So it was advantageous for them to be at their peak performance in the dark. It's not any dumber than <laughs> these guys developing magnetic powers to fend off metal monsters. You said predator and all I can think of is predator. Oh, you mean like the one that Arnold Schwarzenegger like, fights, right? Like this one. <laughs> <laughs> that predator. Right, right. You ever watch Speed Zone? No. It stars. I've looked at that ad many times. Melody Anderson, Peter Boyle, Donna Dixon, John Candy, Eugene Levy, Tim Matheson. Well, I like those guys. And the Smothers Brothers. Wow, it's, it's some heavy hitters. It's in weird. Speed Zone. All the well, all the ones at the end. I know the first two or three names. I don't think I knew. Yeah. Did you say Peter Boyle? Peter Boyle, yeah, he's famous. I know him. Young Melody Francis. Anderson, I'm not not familiar. No idea. With her. Donna Dixon, she was the babe. She was actually married to Dan Aykroyd. What was she in? Donna Dixon, I think she was one of the girls in um, Police Academy Four. No, no, in um, what's the the Tom Hanks Peter Scolari TV show? Booze and Buddies. Booze and Buddies. She was the beautiful blonde in Booze and Buddies. Was Donna oh, Dixon? I thought that was Peter Scolari. <laughs> he was beautiful too. <laughs> uh, okay. Like I said, everything seems really kind of run down and shabby here. Even even the shower water is kind of yellow and green. And uh, Lydia says it's almost toxic. But again, he's very nonchalant. Like no big deal. It's it's a. Uh, Toxic yellow green water. Well, yeah, she's um, she's like, just don't drink it. He's like, all right, right. I never drink it anyway. Yeah. He, we see that he has been trying unsuccessfully to convince her to leave Raw. Um, you know, he doesn't want his kid born there, and since she's from Cathoon, she could actually go back there. Whereas he, because of whatever politics are going on that we don't fully understand yet, he is not allowed to leave the planet. He is stuck there, but she could still leave, but she refuses to go. And so we, we cut to the next page here where we, we see him going somewhere. He's supposed to meet his, his best friend Loomis somewhere. And uh, it's just an opportunity to see what remains of Brawl, basically. There's been a big war. I don't think we, we explained that before. They fought the uh, uh, Emiskians. How do you say that? He doesn't have any vowels in there. I think I always say Imsk. 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 <laughs> Imsk. I think I just insert imaginary v- vowels. I think I used to say like Imsk or Imsk in my head. Mm-hmm. So it makes sense. Well, you, you've been calling her uh, Lydia. I always say. I did it again. I always say Lida. Lida. I don't know Lida. which is which. I don't know which could be right. I don't know. It's a one, another one of those stupid names where it's like. It's like a weird version of a contemporary name, you know? Right. 
But it's like L Y D D A Lida. But yeah, I bet they thought, oh, Lydia. Lida sounds all right. Yeah. I'm sure someone will correct us in the comments. I hope. Just leave a comment, Please. everybody. <laughs> We've got to be pissing some of you guys off. Come on. With all this <laughs> false information, incorrect information. <laughs> uh, this this doesn't, to me, read as like a war-torn planet. It looks like, yeah, it looks kind of a like a slum or something, but it's so colorful. Right. He is talking about the beautiful morning skies. And then I guess it, right. you, you sh- you, it shows the skies here and then gradually the next tier of panels, it looks all grungy, I guess. Right. Well, right, and that kind of follows the narrative because, like, at the top, he's thinking back to, uh, like, when he was a kid with Pull, his brother, and then, but as his thoughts get darker and he's getting closer to, I think he, isn't he actually going to where the accident occurred? Or the, isn't he going to the, the bay? I don't think so, because I think Venado Bay turns out to be on Imsk. Oh, it is? Because they do a whole Venado Bay issue. It's uh, around issue 20, okay. 19 or 20, I think. Okay. They tell the story, and yeah, the, it's a war between Brawl and Imsk. I don't think they've even mm-hmm. revealed that yet in this issue. They do at the end in the text page. They do. They do. Um, but when we get to, when we get to Salu, yeah, yeah. Talking about that. Yeah. They, they begin um, to clear that up. But then some months later in the comic, they sort of tell that story and they have, um, cosmic boy and shrinking violet bury the hatchet or something or talk it out or whatever. Right. But I think, I think the Venado Bay thing happened on in another place. Okay. I, There's sure. a couple cues in the next page that make it seem like that could be where he's going, but I believe you. Yeah. Maybe they changed their mind. I don't know. Yeah, we'll talk about it. This is the page I wanted to talk about, the comic strips. Like we've kind of mm-hmm. talked about a little bit uh, a little bit earlier. We talked about how mm-hmm. this is, it really, to me, reads like a daily newspaper strip in the, mm-hmm. in the way that it's condensed. Um, I mean, the one page of the comic is so condensed that it, and it's so deliberately paced in the same size panel boxes that it seems like a newspaper comic strip or a Sunday comic strip. And then mm-hmm. this page is done just like a lot of those gasoline alley comic strips would be where, right. where you, and that stuff didn't really get really wide exposure, I guess. I mean, of course, that had a wide exposure when it came out in the 30s to everybody in the country who's, right. who subscribed to the newspaper. But in, in the interim between whatever, the 50s and the 90s, I don't mm-hmm. know who saw that those comic strips. But Well, I mean, using separate panels to with a consistent background, I mean, I think we've seen that in the past. Like in earlier comic, earlier superhero comics, really a, an effect like this where they have like a Ma- a whole kind of tableau like background, nine, and maybe not all nine panels, but pieces. I feel like we've seen ones where, like, say, a guy is walking down the street across three panels, mm-hmm. and like all the sidewalks connect, and the, the 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 street or the the brick wall behind him connects all, like like he's walking across the panels almost. Mm-hmm. But yeah, nothing quite like this. I think you're right about that. I kind of feel like maybe even in another issue, they do one where it's all nine panels. Like this one stops after the sixth panel. It mm-hmm. doesn't continue where it's a whole, whole image in the, not, in, the right. in the page, but it's got this grid over top of it. And maybe there's, there's b- word balloons that kind of flow across all nine. Right. It's sort of paradoxical to me because like, you have these, they seem more like uh, newspaper strip panels the way the way they're constructed, but most of the time in this kind of book, and even in, in this book, if you look on the left side, what the artist ends up doing, though, is treating it more like film because they can't fit, say, four figures in the panel. They, they tend to do lots of close-ups of uh, faces. Mm-hmm. I think more so than you would see in a comic that has varying panel sizes. Like it, it kind of goes both ways because I definitely see what you're saying on the right. Um, yeah, this does seem like an anomaly. 
when you compare it to to this page where it's all kind of medium shots or close-ups mm -hmm. or extreme close-ups to do this mm -hmm. kind of thing where it's almost like a pan or a a um yeah it's almost as if you're panning across these different mm -hmm. places and like this is your kind of viewfinder this this right whatever one ninth of the page mm -hmm. like that's a little different and in that oral history thing i think al gordon addresses that and says like i right i suggested to keith that he does something like that to kind of break it up a little bit so maybe kind it of, almost sounded kind of like he kind of snuck it in a little bit hmm. like when he was inking it and kind of steered keith that way like there were panels that he was finishing and inking where he, he thought it would make sense to to for the backgrounds to be that way instead of like saying three separate identical brick walls that he's walking by it's all one brick wall mm, yeah but yeah so maybe this sensibility know. is kind of suggested by somebody other than yeah. keith giffen well, wow. yeah, I, th I do is, think that's Al Gordon's influence. Yeah, this is the this is the way Giffen would do it with just a lot of people mm -hmm. talking to each other. Most most certainly. So we see he's he's standing at a checkpoint here, um, and on the wall he sees some graffiti, or at least we think he sees it. It's not a hundred percent clear. He may be hallucinating this. Because it is the it is uh, Venado Bay, Venado Bay, which if it's not Venado, that was one of the things that made me think maybe this is Venado Bay. He's going to one of the one of two things, but if it's not, it seems really out of place. Like why would it be right there? And then why would it be blood? So the blood we know he's clearly going into. He starts going into another one of his flashbacks here. Mm -hmm. So it looks like things are becoming surreal. So what I guess what I'm saying is I'm not 100% sure that that graffiti is even up there. Oh, I guess I kind of assumed it was really there. And then and he it triggers it. Yeah, he lapses into this kind of flashback right. thing. Right. I just kind of think of the Venado Bay is like it's like a it's like their version of Vietnam this mm -hmm. unwinnable war that happened. Mm -hmm. And like in the seventies they had, I remember right. in dog day afternoon, he gets them to start chanting Attica. Remember that part? Uh -huh. And there was, uh -huh. that was that prison riot, you know, it was like this kind of social issues kind of, right. Kind of thing where people, would, it was just in the zeitgeist. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, here on, here on brawl, there's, there's probably, probably wounded veterans and they're floating around guys just like right. cosmic boy and some some yeah, crazy guy sense. with ptsd like he whatever he cut a slice in his hand and he wrote it up there just as a way to to like complain that this is what happened to him or to get some that you know well yeah that's one way of looking at it another way is um it is in fact written there but it's just written in paint and then because in this middle tier, we, he seems to be moving into the imagined world. So maybe as he's segueing it into that, like the paint starts to become dripping blood. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he could be imagining it too. Like if you, if you look at the dialogue, he says, you know, my God, that's human blood. What kind of desperation right. could have driven someone right. to do this? And at the top, he mentions... I mean, it's a little like it's probably there, but he, he says it seems bizarre that it's there. Like he said, I have not seen graffiti on Brawl in, in years, mm -hmm. but I don't know why he wouldn't as dilapidated as everything else is. But yeah, I mean, they, they could they, be trying to make make Cosmic Boy more like even more um, ill than we kind of assume right. he is like. Right. I never really thought of it this way, but I guess now that you're pointing it out, it's like, yeah, maybe he is anytime he sees whatever, a certain type of mess <laughs> or whatever, he's mm -hmm. he he starts to flash back and, right. and yeah, maybe he doesn't see the actual words of Venado Bay right. uh, on there. 
maybe he just sees a mess and he's like, this is blood. This is whatever. This is what happened to me. Yeah, I don't know. This, I mean, it, it's a good way, I guess, like in a way that I had never really have seen to address mm-hmm. this kind of thing. Like they do it in 70s movies with these Vietnam vets. There's a ton of this Vietnam vet stuff that came out in the mm-hmm. 70s and 80s, Rambo and whatever. Um, like the deer hunter, maybe? Yeah. Okay. Um, and like that was a big thing in the 80s, you know? Like that was mm-hmm. like due to 10 or 12 years ago had to go fight in a losing war when they are teenagers and stuff like perfect this is a perfect thing to put in this comic book Mm -hmm. and have it be have have one of the characters be a victim of that right and it's a weird interesting contrast like between like his his childhood where he's also getting into super violent situations but it's very cartoony and like they always win and Nobody's getting dismembered, you know, people are getting knocked out and they're, they don't end up with head traumas, you know, and um, it's very clean cut. And then as an adult, he, he's in a very hyper realistic kind of war situation, very close to, to the real world, with, complete with dismemberments and PTSD. Right. Yeah, to me, it's strange that actually strange that a person like Cosmic Boy would fight him at war Mm -hmm. like if you think about well he was drafted yeah but like if you compare like what is the legion of superheroes in 2023 is that like a professional sports team or Mm -hmm. what it's like if you sent lebron james right to fight why isn't he like selling bonds or something right he wouldn't fight in that war (laughs) he's too famous and too rich and too powerful or too Powerful is not the right word, but too influential right. to ever like be in the war zone himself. But Cosmic Boy somehow got that. That happened. I guess it's because Brawl is his planet that is perpetually in depression. So even the Magball, Magno Ball Chan. He's also, I mean, they've, they've severely fallen out of favor with the powers that be at this time. Maybe, maybe they're like, yeah, he could be good infantry. <laughs> yeah. You know, let's get rid of this guy, you know. I like this effect where they they have his flashback, and there's these like blood splatters. Uh huh. But then the the real world voice. Yes. Or the the flashback balloons have blood splatter in them, and then the real world voice has no blood splatter in it. Or the guy is like, "Hey, I'm right. talking to you. Hey, buddy. Hey, wait right. up. You know." I think that's kind of a cool effect. Kind of curious what that looked like in the script, even like how they wrote that. And how much of this is, uh, is it still John Workman at this point? This is Todd Klein lettering. Oh, Todd Klein. Yeah. Workman does some of it, right? She's uh, in I that think he, book, I think. Or in that article. Yeah, I think Workman actually takes over maybe in the, in the second yeah. or third issue or something. Yeah. Most, in, in my memory, most of it is John right. Workman. And um, I actually like John Workman better and then uh, Todd Klein, but to each their own. I always yeah. like John Workman because he's like Simonson's go, like Simonson only ever has work many ink his work or oh, letters yeah. work yeah i don't think i've ever seen him with a different letter i kind of like john workman i mean i like the way his letters look mm-hmm. but he's also an indie cartoonist what have you ever seen those john workman comics he no what are you talking about i had no idea no he's done quite a bit he did stuff in he did stuff in dark horse presents oh really um and he had like this comic that came out from like this kind of like weird pervy publisher like these kind of softcore looking things <laughs> Weird. But he has a style that's sort of like Pete Morisi almost. Oh, but it's a awesome. little bit, it's a little bit more naturalistic than Pete Morisi. I don't know. I think I I like the way he draws and his his letters look perfect for the comics that he's made. But mm-hmm. the, like his lettering looks great on whatever all this other stuff on Legion on Simonson on on and on. Yeah, he did a comic in Dark Horse Presents in about five or six issues of the early ones like within the first year of dark horse presents called roma and they're all um that'd be before your time wouldn't it that's pretty early right 80s i've seen them as back issues yeah okay but he they're drawn like um they're drawn like a newspaper strip they're drawn like you have to turn the comic book sideways to read them because they are all um landscape for for this page right they go this way yeah 
but they look good. Check them out. Dark Horse presents maybe oh, well. eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, or something like that. I miss, I miss books like Dark Horse presents. I like I like anthology books. Several different. It's kind of neat. You buy one book and it has two or three very different things in it. I like that. Mm-hmm. It's a lost art. Yeah, those dark early Dark Horse presents. They had I don't know, like they had like John Workman, Ron Randall, Tony Sammons. Oh, and yeah. then like the mask or whatever by like Mark yeah, Badger yeah. or something like totally f- off the wall. Right. And then eventually you, you start getting like, well, Frank Miller, I think started Sin City over there. Yeah. John oh, yeah. Byrne I remember, I did think, next men over there. Yeah. I think I got one of those. Like it, like the first one that has, it has next men, Sin City, mm-hmm. something by Gray Morrow in it, maybe. Oh, wow. And then yeah. like Dave Johnson. <laughs> Right. You know, like it's really weird. Right. And every now and then they have like a big alien story or something in there. Uh-huh. Well, like a lot of yeah. issues would be guys you never heard of. And then the aliens or, or the predators would show up. And Flaming Carrot. I think Flaming Carrot was in there some. Uh, Cosmic Boy is passing the checkpoint and he's going into the um, Forbidden Zone, whatever it is this is. So the guard snaps rock out of... Um, out of his little PTSD daydream. And we can tell if you look at him close, he's got beads of sweat. Oh, yeah. Like he just went through something right, right. there while he was right. waiting in right. line. The guard seems pretty impressed with his crimson clearance, which apparently gives him free reign of the planet, but not so impressed to not hold on to it until Rock comes back. So he's not... It's not that in the clear. There, It's still a pretty oppressive place. Like I don't get this place. Like... It's it's under heavy guard. Cosmic Boy, even with his special clearance, like I don't know why Cosmic Boy would have the special clearance, maybe just because he used to be a legionnaire or he's high enough profile that you can't take away all his rights. Right. But it's this weird place where he goes and it's like, why why would you want to keep anybody out of this place? It looks terrible. This is one of the other clues that made me think maybe this was the bay. Hmm. Like it's quarantined off. The third reason is when we get to the bottom here, he says, Loomis, this better be good. Then make him meet him here. Like, like this is a place he does not want to go. Yeah. He says, if you're dragging me out here for no reason, I swear to God. Right, right. But this is his best friend. And if it's like, if you're dragging me to your house for no reason, I swear to God, that seems kind of douchey. It seems like we know it's his place, but that he lives there for some reason. But Seems like it's somewhere he does not want to go. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I don't, I don't think this winds up being Venado Bay. I, I could believe. Be wrong. No, I believe you. I believe you. But yeah, it, I feel. But like I don't know what this place is. Like this is just some Ground Zero where it, right Imskins oh. dropped a bomb or something. But then why mm. does why is Loomis out here? You know, right? Very mysterious. I like Loomis, the new character with this issue, but uh, I like that they kept him around. You think he's named after Andrew Loomis, the famous artist? You seen those Andrew Loomis books? Like Steve Rude's way into him. He's mm-hmm. this illustrator from the the whatever the forties and fifties, big into whatever illustration theory and stuff. Has a handful of illustration books mm-hmm. and composition books and stuff like that. Really great drawer of the mid twentieth century. That seems the most likely. Uh... Wasn't that also, was that Donald Pleasant's name in the Halloween movies? It could be. I've only ever seen the first one. I don't know. I only ever saw that. I only saw the first one like three years ago, too. Oh, yeah. I keep forgetting you grew up in a really religious home. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked about it. I never Didn't, saw any R movie until I was 28 years old. <laughs> Didn't drink until you were 30. I'm making up for lost time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, on to the other half of the page here. We we have a change of scenes, and um, we seem to be, are we above Brawl? Um, there's an occupational headquarters for the Emiskians, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> where, where we see that a prisoner is being transported, and the prisoner is none other than Field Commander Salu Digby, formerly known as Shrinking Violet. She now has a large scar across her eye, and apparently her eye is bionic or artificial. 
We also learn that she is refusing to have the scar removed. Yeah, this is probably the biggest change or the biggest surprise maybe for um, old time Legion fans is that. It probably was for me because like I said, I missed I missed all that 80s stuff. When I went back, she does sort of, there's sort of an in-between point where she kind of becomes a lot tougher, more assertive. Like around the time she dumps uh, Duplicate Boy. Yeah, I suppose. It's actually maybe more, maybe in my memory, it's more around the time she gets her new costume where they switch. It's totally stupid to think of it this way, but like she had, she wears a, a white and green skirt is her mm-hmm. costume. And then it's changed to a black and green skirt. Uh-huh. And that's kind of a big change. Mm-hmm. Actually, she goes from the white and green skirt to a black and green uh, unitard. Right. And then she gets the skirt back, but it's instead of a little white collar, it's a black neck thing. Right. And I think she gets a new personality at that time, that right. costume change, which is somewhere in the like the middle of the third volume uh, Baxter series or something like that. You don't think it, I thought her personality change was kind of tied to her being like tortured and like a prisoner. Mm-hmm. But I think she has much, a, a bigger change when she gets, she gets kind of an image overhaul too. Right. And I think then it happens at the same time that her personality changes a little bit. Right. She always seems very punk rock to me there. And it, it's entirely because of Jaime Hernandez, that drawing he did of her in that costume. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that makes For sense. For like the like who's a, who. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like you can imagine the who's who. Like this is the way Jaime would draw her if she mm-hmm. was in the 50s. And then like she looks like Hopi mm-hmm. uh, in here or something. Right. Well, he did it. He did it in the who's who for sure. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. I, I thought you were saying you could imagine. I'm like, no, he really. Oh no, no! Her. Like, I, I can imagine, like, if he was drawing her as a '50s character, it would look right. like the way he drew her in that comic. Right. And then if I if I imagined her, if I imagined the way he would draw her in 1989, mm-hmm. yeah, it would right. look like this. Right. When she, yeah, like you say, punk rock. She. Right. This is kind of how Hopi looked in a way. I don't think Hopi ever had this straight up buzz cut like this. Right. Right. But the um, the just the kind of the body language, what little there is of it. Kind right. of looks like, kind of looks like that. Kind of looks like, and I, I wonder if he had to have been right. Giffen had to have seen some of those Love and Rockets things, right? I don't know if he was invested in the story or not. Of course, those famously have a lot of nine panel grids. When I when I kind of talked to him about other comics and indie comics, and if he'd ever thought about like doing independent work or like making mini comics of his thumbnails, he didn't seem very familiar with like indie indie comics but maybe some of that has to do with that scathing comics journal (laughs) review maybe Mm. maybe he just steers away from anything close to that but he's also from that kind of craftsman or that kind of like it's a job like why would i do this for free he didn't say that but i could that's the vibe i kind of got from him like yeah i can totally see him as as yeah, I mean, he is like one of these kind of journeyman uh, comic book, corporate comic book makers. Right. And he just has, there's something in him that wants to wants to expand a little bit, but right. he is still just at the will of whatever sells and doesn't sell. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like, there was a sense like he didn't think it would sell anything or no one would give a shit. But still, he's, you know, if he's looking at Jose Munoz comics to... to and we know he is because he's redrawing the panels in ambush. Right, right. I don't know. He's probably seen some Jaime Hernandez comics, but yeah, I don't. I don't imagine that he's he's read a bunch of Love and Rockets, and he's like, oh yeah, this Maggie Hopi relationship that could we could graft that on right, to right. to uh, Lightning Last and Saturn or, and Shrinking Violet. But uh, you could you could almost see the connection there, right. And oh, sure. and this this is also the uh, this is another one of these probe guys. This guy seems like he um, he's got kind of an attitude, you know. He's a robot, but he's right. She's pretty dismissive of him, but we can't tell if that's because she thinks, you know, he's just an appliance, or if she just 
doesn't respect authority. I think she probably does not respect this robot guy at right. all. Right. Um, it's weird because these guys are totally new within the last five years, which is, I don't know. It's kind of a strange, like brand new technology. So to be so ubiquitous in the mm. universe, like within five years, five years ago, when we were reading Legion of Superheroes, no, no sense that there was anything like this. And now they're on every planet. They're in the military. Right. Um, making, I don't know. It seems like this guy can but make decisions. It's all but just sort sure. of matter of factly. It's not like for it to be, you would think it'd have a bigger impact in what's going on. Like they'd be talking about how it's changing society in the way that like social media changed mm-hmm. our society within five years or yeah, I don't know. This guy seems like he has an opinion mm-hmm. and he seems to be like affecting, effecting changes in the world around him. But then he's also maybe just like a receptionist. I don't know. I'll have to dig deeper into that source book. Maybe they talk about it. I've also yeah. been reading his, uh, you know, I'm a senator. Yeah, yeah, I looked at that today too. Like he, he had posts even last year. So he's still kind of working on it. I went all the way back to the beginning. Wow. Yeah, there's no reverse chronological order that I could find. That was a real pain in the ass. Oh, yeah, <laughs> blogs and, yeah, that stuff is never very good for that. It's all right, though. I bookmarked it. I'm working my way through. So the the general is offering her an honorable discharge in exchange for her silence about but not obey, but she's, re- she completely refuses. And, um, but she ultimately gets what she wants this way. She gets to keep a clean conscience. She has, I guess she's a conscientious objector or a moral objector to what happened. Yeah. She explained that she'd been in the, in the brig or in the, um, right. She'd spent a couple the, weeks in the, the brig. Is it the brig? She doesn't say brig. What's a word? I think she does. Well, stockade. Stockade, right. She's been in a stockade for some period of time for, um, yeah, I guess because she's right. not going to continue working with this military anymore. Right. There was one thing I wasn't sure about. Maybe you could clarify. I mean, so did they win the war and they're occupying Brawl right now? Is that what's going on? Because I kind of get that impression, yeah. That's the impression I get, too. That's why, the, yeah, like they... This this military um, satellite thing is hovering over brawl. Right. right. The, all the brawl people are living in squalor, and right. there's this military occupation force uh, uh, keeping an eye on them. So, like, say that guard that he had, that he had to show his badge off to is he he an a Miskian then? I would assume that he is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Or he's a. Whatever, some sellout brawly and working with the imps government military or something to keep people in line. So anyway, they cut her loose. She's glad to be free, even if it's a dishonorable discharge. You know, she gets to get to keep a clean conscience. And we see that she is doing something that looks almost exactly like email, which I guess email probably existed in some form at that time. I don't know. Could people on the message boards email. Was yeah, that... this is, this is closer to BBS than that. Email, right. I guess. Right. But it's I think close. they had email back then. Probably. I mean, I certainly like the military or somebody had it, but I'm a little young to have, to know anything about the origins of email. I don't think I saw an email until like maybe 94, 95. They yeah, that's probably, true. Real, certainly yeah. Around. I didn't even use the internet until 97. Yeah. Uh, did you get one of those discs in the mail? Oh, oh, she, oh, she's writing her email. Right. And she has a gigantic send button on her right. keyboard. That's to just like today. <laughs> uh, it's, it's crazy to think that somehow between now and a thousand years from now, the send mm-hmm. button just gets bigger by about right. five times. There's a, um, so it looks like, um, Garth has offered her to 
the opportunity to, to work on their farm. Yeah. Um, Garth Rand's Lightning Lad. Garth Rand's former Lightning Lad. I kind of like that in this middle left panel, it's cropped in such a way. It doesn't really give you all the information, which, but this is like a, you'd have to be a fan to really catch the references. You know, they don't, they don't spell it out. Um, I, uh, I agree that they don't give the references. I don't agree that the cropping really does anything to it. It just yeah. it crops off like one letter on the right and the left side. Fair enough. You can see it. They almost yeah. didn't need to do it that way. It's like it, like you would do that to make it seem like the letter is bigger than what we're shown. Oh, right. Like it's a skinny little paragraph. <laughs> yeah, or something. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's as if you could read that, scan through that, and you get the whole context, even though, you know, there's like, another th- third out here and right. another third out here. But right. the truth is that like it says exactly where I elong. Okay. The B is gone. There's right. one letter that's gone. Uh, I just hope Garth oh, meant it. That's what that word is. <laughs> when he said Y O and there's a U that's gone. U. Uh-huh could you so there's very little missing right i don't know it's kind of a weird like they they wanted to make it make it seem like we're not getting the whole message and just getting the basics right. but actually they just sheared off right one letters width of information off of yeah each side. yeah well it worked <laughs> yeah you just demystifying everything um <laughs> I like this outfit that she wears where it's a, a tank top over a t-shirt over like a long sleeve, like mm-hmm. full, um, full right. sleeve. I don't right. know. It's like, it's not even gloves. I don't think it's as if she's wearing like a whole like bodysuit with gloves beneath she, her t-shirt. Oh yeah. Top. They are gloves, aren't they? She's probably real warm. Mm-hmm. A lot of layers, and I also like this blast panel, this silhouette of the the um, it's this ship that she's on, mm-hmm. which is kind of a neat ship, like a really util- utilitarian ship. So she There's is she a, a passenger over this kind of plane? Is she a passenger or is she flying the ship? It almost seems like she is the only person on this ship. Seems like a big ship for one person. Yeah. Maybe it's like an automatic. They they offered to drop her off wherever she wants, and they kicked her out. And it's just like on autopilot to. It's definitely like a Star Wars kind of ship. Like you cannot mm-hmm. land this ship. It has mm-hmm. to stay in orbit, and the only way to get down is to take a secondary like shuttlecraft or be beamed down. A right. La Star Trek. They don't beam in Legion, do they? I don't know. All right, so uh, we onward to the next page. Uh huh. So back on Brawl, we have Rock talking to Loomis a bit before Loomis just runs off without telling him even why he dragged him out there. And it turns out it was all kind of set up by by Reap, who's. Um, kind of arrange this incognito meeting because he's doesn't really want the government paying attention to what they're what he's got in store and uh that's about all i have to say about this page other than like uh, i kind of mentioned before i i like this kind of slightly older maybe a little more contented uh more sure of himself uh version of chameleon boy less emo less whiny yeah, he definitely looks older. Mm-hmm. Like if you look at these close-ups. Yeah. Um, and it, Loomis lives in this weird hut. Yes. I'm really curious what this area is. Like it's a place that's like ecologically devastated. Mm-hmm. And for some reason this man, and he has like, I guess on the next page, it's revealed that he has uh, one of these probe droids who lives with him. 
Oh no, that, that's actually this is actually um that's Chameleon Boy's uh, personal assistant. Yeah. yeah. So he lives out here by himself and he traps. But it's a place where the there's no prying eyes of the government out here in this area, but it's also all cordoned off right. and guarded. Well, we know that that he was the guy with Rock when the explosion occurred. That's how he lost his arm. Yeah, I think he lost his powers, his magnetic powers as well. And they almost uh, imply that he may have some mental illness going on here. Like Rock says something like half the things he says doesn't make any sense. Though he seems pretty lucid later in the series, but maybe they get him on some meds. Uh, I, I guess we have to mention that both of these guys, I think both of these guys have lost their, their natives of planet Brawl where right. everybody has magnetic powers, but right. because of the their experience in the Brawl Imps War, they've lost their magnetic abilities. Right. And and this guy even has lost his arm. I think they right. revealed it earlier in this show. And I think episode. they get into, there's like a specific weapon that does it, but even without knowing that, I like the idea since it's just a natural part of who they are. Of course... Someone could sustain an injury where they would lose their power, just like they would lose their arm or something like that. It makes sense to me. I mean, in one way, it seems kind of contrived and weird and silly, but I also like, oh, that's a perfect thing. Like there's a there's a Vietnam analog that mm. happened in the 30th century that they can use to mm-hmm. kind of springboard stories for them. Sure. In in a way that like real Vietnam spawned a million stories back in the 80s Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but they have a war in the future and the same kind of shit happens the Mm -hmm. same kind of um uh henry kissinger fuck faces are in charge of it and the same kind of casualties occur among their old regular people and even among big stars like cosmic boy for sure Henry Kissinger fuck faces. I'm still fucking alive. I know, and how come he hasn't fucking died yet? It's unreal. I heard this guy just saying the other day, like, that's how he knows there's not a god, because that guy is still alive. <laughs> <laughs> As they're walking off, we see that um we don't well, we don't hear it. He's clearly Reap is clearly telling Rock his plan and he freaks out. It's like, what? Are you nuts? Oh, yeah, it's a little gag. He's like, well, I've got this scheme. Psst, right. psst, 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 psst. Yeah, it's like a gag panel. It's like a whole, like the whole thing is yeah. a gag. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a comic strip gag. I feel like I read a whole like blog post not too mm-hmm. long ago about how Keith Giffen's whole timing structure mm-hmm. is like a comic strip gag. Like mm-hmm. every every scene he does is mm-hmm. set up like a a gag. Mm-hmm. It's it's less like a um, like a dramatic moment and more of like gag timing. Well, I think at some point they're encouraged to write the pages like that. Like every page sort of has a punchline at the end, not necessarily like a funny thing, but something some kind of payoff. Yeah, I suppose it it, it it's a way to like yeah end every page before you flip mm-hmm. over to the and you're in the next scene or right. the next. Um, location you know something that just occurred to me uh since i i think i was i don't know 11 12 when i when i first read this and i'd read it over and over as i got older and i didn't always understand everything that was going on and i'd have different ways of interpreting it as i got older and i think a couple years in i i became convinced that loomis was chameleon boy in disguise because of this he walks off and then he turns around and then he's just there. And then he says something about like, uh, sorry for, you know, the deception or, or the, mm. and it made me was is it like, was Loomis not here? Was that, was that, uh, and maybe actually, maybe that's still the case. We know Loomis is off with his assistant, but we don't necessarily know that. Oh yeah. I, I guess on, on the next page, it is totally revealed that Loomis is actually a distinct person from uh, chameleon boy. Oh no, I'm not implying that he's a different guy. 
I'm implying that the, I thought you were trying to say that maybe Loomis has been chameleon by the whole time. No, 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 no. What <laughs> no. I'm saying is the Loomis that he has met up there. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, as a oh, sideline, oh, yeah. um, Loomis is talking to uh chameleon voice probe droid. That's right. Um, and, uh, He's clearly, yeah, he's he's living off the land there. He's eating li- lizards, it looks like, some sort of lower, uh, some sort of, like, pest-like animal he's living off, some equivalent, brawling equivalent to, like, rats. Well, he um, catches it and lets it go. Is that a metallic monster that you can't eat, maybe? That would... <laughs> <laughs> See, really, they should have... It would make more sense instead of the magnetic powers. They'd have like super strong teeth and the ability to like digest metal more like Tenzel. Hmm. He mentions that he hopes that, uh, you know, uh, Reap Daggle isn't going to ditch Rock once he finds out he doesn't have his power. Now, this is the first page where we're, where, or he refers to him as a crip. Hmm. Yeah. And at first I'd like, he joined a gang sometime during the five years later. <laughs> <laughs> So here we see that Reap knew all along about his condition and he wants him just the same. He doesn't need Cosmic Boy. He needs Rock Crin. You know, everyone on this planet has that power. He can certainly afford to get someone who can use the power as well as Cosmic Boy ever did. And this is kind of like my favorite part of the book. It's probably the sappiest part where he's given up and he, he said, what does he say there? Like, there's no hope or the dream is dead. And then Chameleon Boy is like, no, you can't kill a dream. Oh, yeah. He's like, uh, whatever we had, we let it die. No, you can't kill a dream. Yeah, that's like the big dramatic part of the book. You remember the rock? You remember the dream rock? Mm. You remember how it felt? Right, right. And then we, we segue into another another sepia kind of flashback. But notably, this is not, you know, a bad one. <laughs> he's having a good flashback for a change really well drawn i like how you know it's an we we all know the story so well that we don't need every little detail it's like just bits and pieces bits of dialogue this one they actually um yeah they actually um they mentioned the quintile Mm -hmm. crystal which is like a sort of a a much later retroactive uh story where it's like Oh, this is the very first mm-hmm. case of the Legion of Superheroes, but it's from it's from the seventies, you know. Like they was they it the seventies? Was later. it that late? Uh, yeah, yeah. This is sort of an, uh, a sort of a uh, conglomeration mm-hmm. of of what eventually we know as like the the early right. first stories. Because in, in Adventure Two Forty Seven, they didn't reveal any of this stuff. It happened in Superboy right. One Forty Seven, where the they wrote their origin and then the quintile crystal story yeah. was from a couple of years after that. I do. I really love uh, the whole look of that page. And I almost wish like I, I would read a whole, you know, Keith Giffen, like silver age set story. Like I love, I love the look of the, the, I love all their original costumes. Yeah. He managed to pull off making them look like uh, mm-hmm. youngsters and yeah, they like their, their old costumes mm-hmm. look kind of kind of blousy right, and baggy right. but he still managed to stick mm-hmm. in this guy this um this dude with the eye eyeball thing which is a giffen character or a giffen alien race that he draws yes, everywhere yes you know when i'm looking at it now it doesn't look like i could have sworn i remembered seeing didn't he have his i thought he had his space helmet on not on, but I thought we saw like the neck part of it, but it doesn't look like it's there. To me, it kind of looks like it is like you can see a little bit of a glare okay. right here. Like he's like popping oh. off his head like it's a, a hoodie or something. So it's hanging behind him could or be. something. Or those could be the rocket backpacks. I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah. I like your theory better. I mean, he, he looks dumb with the bubble yeah. head, but I like the collar because he's cosmic. Boy, uh-huh. so. I think one time we talked about the this part where it says Rock Crin optimum leadership potential, and if if that was if it kind of first showed I up think here so. or like in their earliest 
whatever in the Superboy right. 147 story, like did they mention that? that cosmic boy was the ideal leader or is that like a well it, you know it does have the feel of something from like the weisinger era but i don't remember anything like that and obviously he was hardly ever the leader back then he might have mm-hmm. been the leader when we first met him i don't actually remember a distinct period where he was the leader mostly it was like saturn girl and i know he was leader at some point there but it wasn't like for a long period or anything notable i don't think yeah, that was something I put in my notes is that, uh, like, is Cosmo Boy really right. so great? We learned that Giffen right. just likes him. It's his favorite character. And he's his favorite favorite Legionnaire. Like, but, uh, you know, it's probably, in a weird way, it's probably the most lasting thing from, from this period of Legion history. Like, because... On uh, issue 300, he's... this. Cosmic Boy is the character that right. Giffen chose to draw, and, along with Prody, but right. he chose he the limited Boy. series. And you know, everything about this, everything about this has basically been erased and said, you know, it's not canon or whatever. But one thing that has stuck more than anything else is he's basically been the leader ever since. He's like the go-to leader guy in every, like even when mm-hmm. Levitz picks it back up, at least in the issues I've seen. He's the leader. Yeah, for some reason, people like that mm-hmm. notion. But I think prior to to mm-hmm. this stuff, this volume four stuff, he was just an average guy, and, or an average. I think he was hero. And I think he. I was even looking at the um, the the um, I'm a senator mm-hmm. blog, you know. And even Tom Beerbaum kind of points out that giffen there's there's kind of two versions of cosmic boy there's the the work a day um stand up superhero mm-hmm. guy from early mm-hmm. in the run and then there's the heart and soul of the legion that giffen liked mm-hmm. and i think that's the stuff that's all giffen uh and people who are like no rock crin he's always been the heart and soul of the legion like they didn't think that until until this and yeah i don't i mean i i think he's a great character he's one of my favorites i like him a lot but and i think he's a great leader but i don't know if he's the heart and soul again like we were saying earlier it seems more like it'd be someone like polar boy is more like Mm -hmm. i don't know optimistic about it or in this case chameleon boy oh yeah like yeah totally like polar boy and chameleon boy those guys are the the true believers the real real guys like cosmic boy he quit he quit right he was like what legion everybody is all old i think he i mean he needs him because he's kind of a figurehead because it's he needs like i'm getting one of the original guys back so you got to take me seriously and he's probably he's probably a good like tactical leader but i don't know that he has that spirit that gets everybody like yay it's like when you're when you're doing the revival of an old TV show, you gotta get one of the old cast members on there. Yeah. So he got he went back and he got David mm-hmm. Duchovny back. He couldn't get couldn't get um, yeah. Jillian Anderson. She she was yeah. like, "Fuck that! You couldn't pay me enough to do right. that." But David Duchovny's like, "Yeah, I'll be Mulder again, whatever." Yep. Or uh, maybe we could talk about it in terms of Night Court. Oh no, that's so sad. <laughs> I don't have anything else to contribute to this issue. Um, <laughs> All right, well, fuck it. So, um, yeah, Cosmic Boy comes out of his little uh, uh, nostalgic fugue, re- remembering the early days of the Legion. And he's like, yeah, I remember how great I fucking felt, dude. <laughs> fucking so fucking good. Well, he's like, it's never going to work because he's stuck here. And then re reveals he's pulled some strings he can get him off planet and then he he's like i'll never be able to convince my wife and he's like she's already packed up so is loomis they're all ready to go we were we were leaving whether you wanted to go or not right and uh cosmic boy's like why you (laughs) son of a bitch you got me just like the old days yep and they yeah we're off Mm. and running ready for issue number two but there's a little epilogue here yes a um, mysterious figure is talking in the dark to another mysterious figure yeah this is weird there's 
like there's a one word balloon that's in English and a word balloon that's in uh, an right. alien language and it is translated mm -hmm. down here. It's, it's one alien speaker speaking to another person and then the, the guy speaking English or Interlac, he's like, speaking on it, speak Interlac. And so they do. Um, and then the, the, um, the, um, like the case changes in some of these other mm -hmm. word balloons. It's as if we're in a dark room talking to, I don't know, a couple of different people, right. maybe. The yellow word balloon who speaks alien is right. talking to and I a think couple of different people, maybe. In subsequent pages like this, with the with this character, it looks like there's several people talking. Yeah, I think they they even bring in more right. balloons, right? And then kind of it's like the gag at the end is it's one guy talking in the dark. But in this case, I think it actually is two people, because one of these is a dominator spy, right? Yeah, the the yellow word balloons is a dominator. And they're they're going into like the right. Cell they're gonna or something let them loose and put a contract out on the legion. Nip it in the bud before yeah, it how, reassembles. How long do they draw this out? I thought it was for because is it revealed in the next issue? I think it went it, a little bit. I remember like yeah three right. or four issues where they would like do these little right. interludes with the the all the different right. word balloons and different font uh -huh. styles of the whatever the mm -hmm. the people the guy should we just say this is roxas the butcher who killed everyone on trom he's in prison and the dominators are going to kill use all of element element lads people he he has kind of an interesting story they do sort of an interesting thing with him and this is a guy who or a character who i don't think they did much with after that he might have showed up one or two more times in all those intervening years, if at all, I don't know. Well, okay, I think... Uh, but they bring it back now. I'm trying to remember if he... Okay, the issue that always stands out to me, of course, is when Element Lad wants to kill him to get revenge for what he did. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's Chemical King. And right, Element and Chemical Element King kind of pulls him off the ledge or whatever. But I can't remember if there was a first time or if they just bring that up in flashback. Did he show up once before? Was he in the Silver Age? I think maybe he was in the Silver Age. I think they must have introduced the concept of him, even if they didn't actually show the the whatever the genocide I think. Well, no, committed they didn't do that. Strong. But I think I think he did show up in the Silver Age, like in the Kurt Swan days. And then, of course, he looked very mm -hmm. different back then. He had a beard. Um, but then that that other story is like maybe Grill. And that's yeah. the one where we realize that he is so e tortured either by his conscience or by literal ghosts. We're guessing he's gone crazy. And he thinks all the all the the people he killed on Trom are like yelling at him and screaming at him in his head. Oh, really? You think it was introduced that far back? Well, at that, that point, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he thinks the, they show like it's kind of a Twilight Zone kind of ending, like... You see that he's in his own hell and he sees all the ghosts around him like pointing at him or something and he's begging for their forgiveness. And then you cut to the legionnaires who see just him acting that way and they're like, he's lost his mind. Like the, the uh, his constant. That sounds cool. That sounds kind of like, could be very, uh, real spooky, you know? It was. It was a good issue. You haven't read it? Come on, man. Let's see if it, I can make it appear. Well, that's a whole page, splash well, page. Yeah, I think it is. It might be cropped here. They really gave Roxas a makeover, didn't they? Yep. Yeah, he seems... Um, he reminds me of, like, uh, that guy from the B-52s in this. Only homicidal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Sign says, stay away, fools. Um, the next page is this um, a full-page text thing. It talks about the... Um, the United Planets collapse. It's on an iPad. Uh, yeah, in 19, or 2992. So that would be two years prior to the events of this issue. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, read this on your own time, viewer. 
<laughs> this page is from 2990. This is practically right after the events of um, this guy. Oh. The, the president of Earth has issued uh, a list of points about why they should dissolve the Legion of Superheroes. And then this letter is from two years after this. It's the current Legion of Superheroes leader, Breck Bannon, we know as Polar Boy. He's going to dissolve the Legion um, against his better judgment. He wishes he didn't have to do it. He's been forced, his hand has been forced in ending the Legion of Superheroes. Also, he's probably the only member at that point. Like almost yeah, everybody has walked at that point. Even the subs have walked by these the three point. letters take place before the events of this comic. Um, and then there's this Flight Ring Village ad. You might want to go back earlier on our channel and watch the Flight Ring Village video where we talk about the Flight Ring Village promo for this new series. This is kind of neat. It's kind of sad to, <laughs> to end on this note where the whole, the, it's a whole page of comics about how the... Um, Earth Gov Earth government has turned Legion headquarters into luxury housing. How does that work exactly? Like the government is is renting out housing, selling are they a commercial enterprise now? But anything it takes, right? Oh, rent it out, sell it, make money off of it. Well, yeah, I could see them selling it. Maybe they sold it to whoever made it the village, right? Yeah, some developers. Yeah owns right. it and manages it yeah some something called earth friends is uh the uh, proprietor of the flight ring village there's a lot of that shit happening here <laughs> like the grade school i went to they turned it into like uh what do you call them like lofts or whatever or like a, oh yeah live work space yeah there's a lot of that stuff going on now and um yeah they've even like they show uh Computo here. He's just like the janitor with the big dust buster. Mm -hmm. Just as a little little coda to the issue to show just how far the Legion has fallen. And then there's this smarmy, smiling right. cartoon Earth, Earth friends. I still love that uh, Brainiac 5 thought it would be funny to just take two of our greatest enemies and mash them together <laughs> into like a guy. Yeah, what? What was he thinking about? You know, he, not only does he write, I mean, obviously he draws like a, like a McGuire, but some of that is written like a little bit like the Justice League. Because he's sort of like an Elrond-like character, that little robot. And him and Polar Boy are always sniping at each other. Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah, like he, he just can't not be a smart ass i think mm -hmm. look at this i had for um superman archives number one oh uh, yeah the most important most imitated character in the history of comic book fiction and original pristine set of superman one through four if available could sell for fifty thousand dollars but for the for only fifty dollars you can get badly recolored very badly <laughs> We made it. We actually did one of these issues. It didn't kill us. Of no, course. We, yeah, we, we got to the end. Giffen art. Yeah. So I see you're drawing comics again. What's that about? <laughs> Am I? <laughs> I've been working on the same four page comic strip for Austin since like August. Oh, yeah. Who are you on this time? I forgot. We're, Ray Morrow? I'm oh, doing always, it. I'm doing a John Fort comic. Oh, right, right. Wasn't did we mention that? Was this issue dedicated to him? Oh, was it? I think it was. Mm hmm It was dedicated to like the, the greats. Dedicated to the memory of John Fort, too often overlooked. Mm hmm That last panel, that that's the thing that really stands out to me. It, like feels primitive or something, because at some point, pretty early on, don't they they start using oh yeah they start to typeset this huh right so that looks more like like ambush bug or something <laughs> yeah we did it that's it that's legion number one
Well, uh, what what do we do now? 